Good morning. My name is Terry. Welcome to my studio slash dining room table slash office. Um, I'd like to talk to you today. What I'd like to talk to you today about is my new technique that I developed for using crayon on fabric. And I'd like to show you how to get from here, which is white muslin that I've traced the hummingbird on, and then here's the finished product after I've added the crayon. And it really is just a step-by-step -step process and I will get into that more later. But what I'd like to do first is talk a little bit about supplies and what I recommend for supplies and why I recommend them. So this is just a pressing pad. My husband makes these. Um, we can give you directions to make them. We also will have them for sale on my website. But something firmer to press on is better than something soft and squishy. This is a non-stick pressing sheet and it comes, this is the size I buy, um, comes in a package that looks like this and it's called the applique pressing sheet. I'll get you to have a good look at that right there. The size is 13 by 17. I just buy it in a package like this. Most quilt stores carry them, but I cut them in half so that they'll fit better. And when you cut them in half and you start coloring and you want to turn your pad, I mean, you want to turn your pressing sheet, it's much easier if it's smaller. So I just fold it in half, make a crease, take my scissors and just cut it right down the middle. That's what I'm going to do right now. The other thing is, I want you to know, is that as you color on these pressing sheets, they are going to stain a little bit. I want you to be sure, no, this is a pressing sheet that I've used over and over. You can wipe it right off. Um, I have crayon cleaner that helps. This is what the crayon cleaner looks like. Um, you just drip a little bit of it on there, use a napkin and wipe it off, and the stain won't come off after you clean everything off. But if you have two pressing sheets, then you can save one for crayon coloring and you can save one for something else where you wouldn't want to be working with a stained sheet. Also, when you're coloring, it helps to have two. Have one laying on top of the other because that will keep this pressing sheet hot longer. And when we get into the coloring process, you're going to see that keeping the sheet hot longer is very important. Um, I'll mention right now too that when I heat the everything up, this is, sheet is gonna get very hot. And I'm gonna remind you of this several times. This sheet will get so hot that if you touch it, it'll hurt. I've never blistered, but you're gonna jump back real fast um, because it gets very, very hot. So just be aware of that. Okay, so we've got our pressing sheet, we've got our ironing board, we've got an iron. Any iron will work. I happen to like these older irons, which I got this one off of eBay. I think it cost about $20. It's an old antique or vintage iron. Um, what I like about it most is that it doesn't have an automatic shutoff feature. Those irons that have an automatic shutoff feature while you're working here or here or over here, the irons over here is turning itself off. So then when you get ready to use it, it's not hot enough. It can be done, it's just frustrating. So I like to have an iron that does not have an automatic shutoff feature. Okay, so the next thing I wanna tell you about is the crayons. That's what this is all about. I use Crayola crayons. I've tried several, actually more than several, many different kinds of crayons. Some what I would consider to be maybe on the lower end of quality, some what I would consider to be higher end more like a professional artist grade quality of crayon. I've tried them all. Crayola crayons really do work the best. So I recommend that you buy Crayola crayons. Now, the box of 96 has all of the colors that I use in my patterns and in my book. So if you buy a box of 64, you're not gonna have all the colors that I recommend. You can substitute colors but you won't have the ones that I've written down to use. I like to take the box, dump all the crayons out, and then put them back in, in color groups. It just makes looking for colors much easier when you have all the yellows and oranges together and all the greens together, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay. The other thing I use, I do use a little bit of pencil. Um, these are the brand I like. I like Lyra Rembrandt Polycolor Pencils. You can get them at an art store. They just happen to be my favorite. You can use any oil or wax based pencil. Just just choose a high quality pencil. Another pencil that I really like and is also more available is called Premier Prismacolor Pencils. And you can get those at craft stores as well as art stores. Okay, so let's start off here. First, I just want to introduce you to my book. Excuse me. This is my book. Creative Quilts from the Crayon Box. It was published by Martingale. It's been out for about four years now. So you can um, you can buy this book at, at quilt shops. You can buy it online on my website, or you can buy it on Amazon, or you can buy it from Martingale Publishers um, themselves. So if you take a look in here, you can see that there's several projects. I have this quilt right here at home. I'll show you that some of my quilts later towards towards the end. And um, that is probably it about my book. Okay, so what I want to tell you now is what kind of fabric I use. I use a muslin fabric. And this is what I want to show you. This is the white muslin that I use. And it's called Southern Bell Muslin. And it's just a nice, high-quality muslin that has a tight weave and a smooth finish. So what I do to prep my pieces, this is a prepped applique piece right here, shaped like a hummingbird with all the details marked on it. This had fus is the fusible web on the back and the muslin on the front. So what I do is I take a piece of fusible web. What I use is steam a seam two. Most quilt shops carry it. Steam Seam 2 has paper on both sides. When you go to take the paper off of one side so you can fuse it to your fabric, you want to remove the paper that doesn't have the grid on it. Toss that away. Then you flip it over and you lay it on your fabric. Smooth it all out like that. And then you smooth it from the other side, like that. And then you come back again, and then you just iron over the fusible web, basically just gluing the fabric to this fusible web. The web is just a glue. Once you've got it all pressed together, then you take your pattern, and I use a light box, but I'm not going to drag my light box out here, but I'm going to show you what it looks like over here. So what I would do is take my piece of fusible web that already has it's fused to the muslin, and you put the pattern underneath with the fabric side facing up, like so, and your pattern on a light box will show through and then you use a micron pigma pen I use a size 02 and you just take your pen and just trace this hummingbird right onto the fabric so what I'm going to do is separate this right now so you can see the pattern through it a little bit better if you have it on a light box it's very easy and very easy to see so I'm just going to pull that off of there if I can and show you how to do that. So what you would do is just, I'm going to lay that right between the paper and the fabric so I can see it better and you can see it better too. There, you can see how that shows through like so. Then you just take your Pigma pen, black, size 02, and you just trace around the pattern like so and you just keep tracing till you have it all traced on there you want to trace all the details so you like you want to get the eye in there the little pupil the eye there 
draw all the little details all around like so. I like to put a little eyelashes right there. And of course you want to trace all of the feather details just like that. And once you get it all traced onto the fabric just like that, you take a nice sharp pair of scissors and just cut it out. I like to use a small, really sharp pair of scissors. It just makes the job easier. And hummingbirds are a little bit difficult to cut out. They're probably one of the more difficult things to cut out. But the sharper your scissors, the easier it'll be. Okay, so get your appliques ready. Now this is how I like to set up my work area and I'll show you why. I have the perfect example. If you're right-handed, I like you to set your iron on the right-hand side. If you're left-handed, set it over here on the left-hand side. Then everything else goes on the opposite side, and this is the reason why. If you start reaching across your iron to get things, you're going to bump it, your hand, right? Right like that. Can you see that? That's, I was reaching for something and hit the edge of my iron right there. That's how I've always done that. So I find that if I just keep my iron here and keep everything that I'm gonna be reaching for over here, then that works better. Now the crayon that you're gonna put on this hummingbird is melted crayon. So what happens is heat this applique up. You pull the paper off like so. So now you have the release papers off the back. Now you have a sticky hummingbird and I just place that hummingbird right in the middle of that pressing sheet. And now that's going to iron down and it's not going to move around and you can heat it up really hot. To put the crayon, the melted crayon, I'm going to melt it right here, you're going to see in a second. I pick the crayon up like so, push it in really hard, I'll repeat that many times because that's real important, and then rub it onto the fabric like so. And like I said before, if you have two of these together, this will stay hot longer because you really want to be blending that crayon into the fabric while it's hot. You're gonna get a much nicer result. And I'll, sh I'll be telling you later in this video um, what to do if everything cools off and you still haven't finished with a color. I'll show you how to fix that and what to do. Okay, so I'm gonna set this aside for now because what I wanna show you First is some practice on some practice pieces that I have here and I'll show you some troubleshooting things like if you make this mistake and you don't like how it looks then this is how you can fix it and so on and so forth. The napkin is a bounty napkin and I'm sure you're all familiar with napkins but I just want to show you the package. Bounty napkins, not a paper towel, because what happens if you use a paper towel is it'll pick that crayon up really good, but then when you go to blend the crayon into the fabric, the paper towel won't let go of it, So, which is what a paper towel is supposed to do. So a, na a napkin works better, and this is the best brand that I've found. Okay, so let me do a little practice here. I've got some muslin that already has fusible web on the back. I'm pulling off the release paper. Now I have a sticky square of fabric and I'm going to lay it right in the middle of my pressing sheet, my non-stick pressing sheet. And I'll review the supplies with you as we go. So now my, I have a hot, hot iron. You don't need steam. It's set on cotton. It needs to be very hot. Mm -hmm. Now sometimes older irons will get hotter than newer irons, so you just, you're gonna have to work with it a little bit. I've never had a problem with scorching, but just be aware that you don't want, if your crayon starts to smoke, it's too hot. That's, but I've never really had a problem with scorching. So I'm gonna heat this up, and I tell my students, you wanna heat it up all over, your, and be aware that you're heating not only the fabric, but you're heating the applique pressing sheet over here too. And this really is probably the hottest area of your iron right there. I'm gonna move this just in case it's in the way. So I say five seconds, so you wanna count one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, five 1,000. Now the first crayon color that I used on 
the hummingbird is inchworm. And so I'm going to just practice with that a little bit for you. So you want to melt your crayon right there because that's where it's hot. Not over here, not here, but real close to the fabric. That's where it's nice and hot. And then you want to scoop up the crayon and I'll show you how to fold these napkins. You want to scoop the crayon up and you don't want to color or blend with the crayon while it's still kind of sopping wet right there. You want to push the crayon in real hard and I can't stress that enough because if you try to color without pushing the crayon in you're going to get blotchy marks and I'll show you what that looks like. But what you want to do is pick that crayon up and then just very very gently start rubbing the hot crayon into the hot fabric. And because they're both hot, the crayon just goes right in and, and just fuses and becomes part of the fabric. And so these quilts are washable, and I'll talk more about that later. They're not throw them in the washing machine washable, but you can hand wash them very nicely. Okay, so that's what you're looking for. And the little pieces that you see gathering, that's just a little bit of the napkin that rubs off. So you want to get a nice, smooth, even color. What you just saw me do, that's it. Melt and blend. The only difference is how many colors do you put on, uh, what colors do you mix, what order do you put them in. And then at the end, um, I do use a little bit of more Pigma pen sometimes to put in... Um, details and then I also will use a little bit of pencil at the end to put in some shading and I will talk to you more about shading in just a bit. So there you have it. That's your first color. So the second color that goes on to the hummingbird is this one and this is called hmm, steel blue and that is a metallic color. In the box of 96 you'll get four metallic colors. And this is the steel blue, and that's the second color that goes on. And in my directions, I would tell you, um, melt and blend inchworm over the top of the head, along the upper part of the neck, along the top part of the upper wing, across the back, and then across the upper one-third of the tail. That's what those directions would say. So now I'm going to practice with the second color, and that's going to go all along here right over the top of the inchworm, and then all along this upper wing, and then across the back, right over the inchworm again, and then across the middle third of the tail. So you can see with two different crayon colors, we now have three colors of green. We have the inchworm green, and then where the inchworm green and the steel blue mix, we have like a grass green, and then where the steel blue goes over the white fabric, we have a blue green. So it's already starting to take some shape and really have some some pretty color contrast there. Okay, so I'm going to iron right over this. This is not going to come off on your iron too much. I, and I say that because if I've ironed, if I've ironed and then colored all day long, and then I clean my iron, maybe just a just a little bit will come off. And this is a good time to show you what kind of crayon cleaner sheets I use for my iron. These are what these are called Iron Clean. They're put out by Bow Nash. You get a good look here too. They look like dryer sheets. When I get them, I pull them out and I cut them in half because you really don't need more than a half. And you use it on a hot iron. So I just put it right here on there. Sometimes I even put a napkin under it because they are a little bit oily. And then you just run your hot iron across there. Now you, I've cleaned my iron so there's really not much anything on there. But this will remove any crayon that gets on your iron and it will also remove any fusible web that might get on your iron. And again that is Bonash iron cleaning sheets. They look like dryer sheets, and this is what the package looks like. Okay, so now I'm going to add the second color. Now you can use a whole new napkin if you want, and when I teach my classes, I have everybody use napkins once, so you don't have to waste time folding um, the the old napkin into a clean spot. It's just faster. But I'm going to show you how to 
fold a napkin right now. So you, just like the napkin comes out of the package, square, fold that square into a diamond. I mean, excuse me, a triangle. Then you turn and fold that triangle into a smaller triangle, just like that. So now you have a small triangle. Now this triangle, you're going to bend both sides in or fold both sides in to make a point right here. So what I do sometimes is just make a fingernail line right down the middle, like that. You want to take this edge, keep that point right there, pull, pull this edge so it jo just goes right past that midline. And then fold this side so the edge goes clear over to that edge. See how that looks? Now you have a pointy little blending instrument. Okay. And if it's not folded perfect like this, that's okay. Just This just happens to be how I like it folded and how it works for me. You might find a way that works better for you. Okay, so I'm gonna reheat this really hot. This is where you wanna make sure all the crayon is wiped off over here because this is where you're gonna get crayon on your iron is if you don't get it wiped off of the sheet really good. So I'm heating this up again really hot, five seconds. Or a little more, you might need to do a little more. Gonna melt the crayon right there. Look how fast that melts. You're gonna get it. You wanna, and when you melt, you wanna melt a pretty good amount. Now in my classes, what I usually say is maybe a silver dollar size, maybe 50 cents. And by that, I mean the size of a half dollar or the size of a silver dollar. Silver dollar seems to work best. And then you wanna pick it up real quick. And remember, this is very important. You wanna push that in. Now I'm going to show you what happens if you don't push it in good enough. You get splotchy marks like that. So you get little lines like that and that. If you push it in real hard, then you're going to have more control over how fast the crayon comes out of the napkin. So push it in real hard. I'm going to start over here and I'm just barely, barely touching the fabric. And I'm just going to start blending that steel blue, which is a real pretty blue-green, all along here. Now where the two colors meet, right in here, you can see that they're not quite overlapping yet. Sometimes I like to leave that because it gives it kind of a, sh uh, a light, kind of almost a, like the sunshine is shining on there. But generally I like to overlap the colors so they blend nicely. So again, I'm just barely pressing and I like to color in a little circular motion like so. And I want those two colors to just blend together gently. What I don't want usually is to have like a dark, hard mark like that. That can be fixed. It's just not, and, and sometimes, depending on what you're coloring, you might want a dark, stripy mark like that. Like maybe if you're doing like rocks or, wood or something, you know, whatever. But generally speaking, I like to have a nice gentle blending between the two colors, like so. And these little pellets of crayon and napkin come off. I just use a little lint roller and just go like that and it's gone. Yep, that's all you have to do. It's just a lot faster. Now, while I've been talking and kind of, you know, whatever, I, this has gotten real cold. This crayon has cooled off real cold. So once it does that, once it gets that cold, it really doesn't want to wipe off easily. So this is what you need to do if that happens to you. Take a napkin. This is important to unfold it all the way because if you try to, if you try to iron through two layers of paper, the heat is not going to get through as well. So I want you to unfold the napkin to one layer of paper. This will protect your iron. You take your hot iron and iron over the napkin. That will heat the crayon up again, but it won't get on your iron. And after you've heated that crayon up again, you just take your napkin and wipe that off. 
just like that. Nice and clean. Okay. So there's two colors that I put on. Now the next color that goes on to the hummingbird is, let me show you this one, purple. Now this purple goes on the, all over the lower wing or the back wing. It goes all along the breast here and into the green here. It goes a little bit there and usually I put a little bit on these upper feathers. And then the purple goes right along where this white area is there, if the purple goes right along there. And see, this is where you want to try and blend your colors nicely and smoothly together. So I'm gonna do that for you right now. So this is our third color and it's called Cyber Grape. It's also, it's a metallic color, so it's a little bit sparkly. Here's a little hint about your napkins. What I do is I like to fold them ahead of time and then what I do is I just stick them pointy and down into a jar or a cup or a mug or whatever you, sometimes in class what we use are just paper cups because that's what we have available. But then you have them all ready to go, just pull one out. If you don't have them folded ahead of time, that's okay. Just remember that you wanna fold your napkin, have it all ready to go before you heat your applique or your fabric. If you heat it and then you start folding, the whole time that you're folding your napkin, this is cooling off. And you want this to be as hot as you can keep it, okay? So, heating this up again, five seconds, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, five 1,000. Everything's nice and hot. You can just feel that heat radiating off of that nonstick pressing cheek. I'm gonna melt that right there. Nice big puddle. Scoop this up quickly. Try to get it right up on your napkin quickly. And then push it in and kind of rub it in. And I, you, I can't stress this, stress this enough. Excuse me. I want to push that in real hard. And then you're going to blend this into these blue-green areas. And what I want to show you is if you blend this purple color into the inchworm areas, you're going to get kind of this taupey color. Can you see that kind of brown color right there? That's what happens when you mix purple with green. That doesn't bother me. In fact, I like a little bit of that. And if you look at hummingbirds in nature, and there are hummingbirds this color. Let me show you the finished product here. Again, there are hummingbirds this color. And if you look at them real close, like if you go online and look at them real close, where their colors merge together, they actually turn that taupey color right under their neck or over by their wings and it's a real pretty sparkly taupey color but um, you know there's that's just in nature I don't like it if there's a ton of that but I do like some okay I'm gonna reheat this because I'm talking all that time it cooled off so I'm gonna heat it again and what I'm gonna do to reheat this crayon because it's cooled off too and this is a little tip for you if that happens to you then you just make sure all of this crayon is wiped off. Heat this up again really hot. And then to heat this crayon again, you just rub it. See how it comes off of there? You just rub it. And it heats all that crayon in there again. And then you can just go ahead and color. And I, I'm pushing very, very gently. And you can see that when you add the purple to this blue, you get kind of a pretty bluish purple color. Now where the purple goes on to the white fabric, like right on here or across the tail, then it's gonna be a real pretty bright purple. But where it goes over the steel blue, it's gonna be a pretty bluish purple. So now we have a lot of different colors going on. And so that would be right here. So we have a lot of variation, which really makes it much prettier and gives it more dimension, which is why I sort of worked this, experimented and kind of worked out this technique over the years, was because I wanted to give my appliques more dimension. That was my favorite part of quilting. I like to do fusible applique, and I think it was because it's like painting with fabric, but I wanted my applique pieces to have more dimension, more realism. So that's 
the reason I sort of started experimenting with lots of different things and landed on cradle of crayons. It seemed to work the best for me. Okay, so there you have it. Now, there's a couple of other crayon colors that go on this hummingbird. And I'm just gonna go ahead and do the hummingbird, do a whole hummingbird for you. You can see how that works. So the colors that I haven't actually showed you yet are, after we put the purple on, here, 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 a little bit up in here, then I put this pinkish color right here, right underneath the neck. And that is color is called Cerise, C-E-R-I-S-E. -E. And in my directions, I tell you all the colors, I tell you where the colors go, uh, when to use them, what order, etc. cetera. Um, all of that is spelled out for you. And of course, you're always free to choose your own colors. Then at the end, when it all, all the crayon color is added, I put a little bit of yellow pencil in here just to kind of give it a little bit of a rosy peachy color and to brighten up the area around the eye. So that would be uh, one of these colored pencils and this is what it would look like. That's the color right there. And then I colored the beak with a pencil and that color would be sort of a darkish brown or a dark gray. Either one, you could use either one. And then I use that same dark gray or brownish gray pencil to put shading in. Now, what I want you to notice here is, and, and this shading is, is really probably the most important thing to me, but I, I love all this coloring. But the shading really adds dimension. So I want you to look here at this one that's not totally colored, and it does not have the shading right along here. However, if you look at this one real closely, you can see that I have added shading all along the edge of these feathers and all along the edge of these feathers. And these two feathers are overlapping this one, so I put a little bit in there too. I only have one rule that I follow for shading. I just like it to be simple and not confusing and uh, anybody can do this, anybody. Um, my, my rule, this is my rule. If one thing is overlapping another, the object that's on top or in front of is probably gonna cast a shadow on the thing or object that is behind or underneath, okay? So when I went to do my shading, I just asked, okay, these feathers are on top of this body, this bird, hummingbird's body. So this, these feathers are gonna cast a little shadow on the body. So I just go right around with my colored pencil and just add a little line, about a sixteenth of an inch. It's not very wide at all. And I just add a little line of shading. Now these feathers are overlapping these feathers in here. So I'm putting a little shading here and all along here, just like that and then a little shading here because these feathers are overlapping that feather. Now I've had students tell me, and this is this is true, if you wanna take the time to do this, some, I don't usually do, but you can put a little shading in here because that feather's coming up here and overlapping the body, so you can put some in there. And then I have students um, who just, yeah, they would really go for it. And so right here you can see there's a little shading where these two feathers are overlapping this feather there's a little shading in there. And then also, you can put shading in between the feathers because technically each one of these feathers are overlapping the next feather. So you could come along here and put a little bit of shading in just like that. And that's gonna give your tail feathers and your wing feathers, if you wanna shade between the feathers up there, that's gonna give it just a little bit more dimension. Once I color in with the um, pencil, I like to take a stencil brush. Now, you can buy these stencil brushes at any craft store. I order them online from Plaid, P-L-A-I-D. And um, I always, when they come, they're a little bit longer. They're about that much longer. I cut them in half because you want this little stencil brush to be very stiff 
and by cutting some of the bristles off, you get a nice stiff brush. So once I put the pencil on, I just take the stencil brush like so, and I just rub the pencil. And what that does is it just blends it and softens it and makes it look a little bit more natural, like a shadow, like a shading. And then you can try to hold this up. You can see there's a difference. If you can see how the shading here really makes this wing pop out. Okay, so now I'm gonna color a hummingbird. Totally for you. Now, this is how I do it in my classes, and the thing, thing, thing about having students right here with me is they can ask questions. Um, I'm gonna try to explain this so you don't have to ask a question. I'm gonna get my napkins here. So I've got my napkin ready, and the instructions would say melt and blend inchworm, so I'll get my crayon ready. Melt and blend inchworm across the back, along the upper one third of the tail, along the top of the head, along the neck, and the edge of the upper part of the upper wing, the top part of the upper wing right in there. Okay, so I'm gonna heat that up. Remember five seconds, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, five 1,000. Nice and hot. You can feel that heat radiating off of there. Okay, so I'm just gonna, about a silver dollar's worth, about the size of a silver dollar. Scoop it up, because you wanna try to get this all done while it's real hot. Again, so important, you gotta scoop it up and then you have to push that crayon into the napkin. Remember, make sure you get the tip of the napkin right there, get that crayon pushed in there and also on the edges. You don't want any wet crayon sitting on the top. And then very gentle with a light circular motion, start adding the color. Now, in this coloring, you do not have to color inside the lines. So I'm getting a little bit of this inchworm on these feathers and these feathers, and that's okay. Don't worry about that. It'll all blend together. So now I'm going across the upper one third of the tail, trying to make everything uniform in color, but as I move in, kind of pushing lighter and lighter so that the color sort of disappears, feathers out. So you don't have any hard, harsh lines. And so I'm gonna turn this. This is where the smaller sheet works better. Now, as I've been coloring, the crayon is working its way out. Now that there's not so much crayon right on top, I'm gonna to start pushing harder and when you push harder, you can see that the napkin starts to break up a little bit. Don't worry about that. But you can push harder to get more crayon out. And it's okay to do that now because a lot of the crayon that was just right on the surface is already gone. So there, I just check it out, take a look. Is everything even? Do I need to blend a little bit more? Am I happy with the result? And everybody is different. If you're happy with it, then that's good. So I'm just gonna use this wrench roller to get the little pieces of napkin off. And I'm gonna use my napkin that I just used to wipe all of this off. This is almost too cold to wanna come off, but I, I think I can get it to come off. Okay, there's a little hair right there that's bothering me. Okay. So now we're ready for the second color. Color number two is the steel blue color. It's a metallic color and it's going to go right over the top of this inchworm. Remember, get all of this wiped off because this is where you're going to get crayon on your iron. Okay, right over the top of the crayon, heating everything up again real hot, counting if you want, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, Five one thousand. Taking color number two, again melting about a silver dollar's worth. You can see there's quite a bit of crayon there, and you want to scoop it up real good. You're going to find that some crayons are different, uh, feel different. Some are thicker, 
messier. Some are not as messy and not as thick. They're more like watery almost in, in consistency. But just push, push that color in real hard like so. Okay, so the directions would say um, melt and blend steel blue over the inchworm along the back along the center or middle one-third of the tail feathers, along the top of the head, along the edge of the neck, and over all of the inchworm on the wing, and then you want to cover all of the feathers on the upper wing with steel blue, and I'm starting to push harder because it's cooling and I want to get a little more crayon out of there. You don't want to push hard in the beginning because there's too much crayon in the neck. If you push hard in the beginning, you're going to get splotchy marks. Okay, so I think that's pretty good. A little bit darker right there. And let me wipe this off really quick before it gets cold. Almost too cold. I don't. I think I'm gonna have to put a napkin over the top. I saved this one. This one. Heat that crayon up again so it'll come off easier. Like so. Okay. And I'm gonna use my lint roller to get all the little pieces of napkin off. Okay. There we go. Now, just a couple things I want to point out to you, and I'm going to use my little pencil as a pointer. You'll notice that when I added the blue-green here, I didn't color all of the inchworm out. I want to leave some of that yellowy, um, bright yellow-green inchworm showing. And I left a little bit of that inchworm showing here, too. If you, if you cover it all up, not the end of the world, it's okay. But... Um, for my own personal, you know, the way I like it, I like to leave a little bit of that inchworm showing. Okay. The next color is Cyber Grape. So I'll get my napkin ready. And let's see, where is my Cyber Grape? There it is. Get my that ready. Okay. Heat everything up again real hot. To about a silver dollar size. Scoop it up like so. And after you've scooped it up, push real hard to embed that crayon right into the napkin. So then you're in control of how fast the crayon is going to come out. Okay, so the directions would say melt and blend, cyber grape over the entire area of the lower wing and over the lower one-third of the tail feathers, trying to blend the colors together nicely. And then melt and blend a little purple into just a few of the feathers in the upper wing, like so. And then the last place for the cyber grape is all along the breast and the body, leaving a little area right under the chin and the neck white. You don't wanna color all of that in because you're gonna put a nice pretty pink color in there. And you wanna leave that area white. Okay. And we have that color on. Wipe this off again. Use my lint roller to get off clean. Okay. The last crayon color is a real pretty pinkish purpley color called Cerise. This is what it looks like. There's the name of the crayon. Very tiny. If you have older crayons, you know they're older and kind of almost vintage, 
because the letters will be about five times as big. Now they make them very small, which make them a little bit harder to see. Um, some colors can be substituted. Like if you don't have cerise, there are several colors that are real similar. So I just want you to know that. Okay, I'm gonna heat this up really hot. Grab my napkin over here. Heat this up again. Every time you add a new color, every single time you add a new color, you have to heat everything up again. Okay, I don't need as much crayon this time because I don't have as big an area to color. So I'm gonna melt about a quarter's worth, about the size of a quarter. Scoop that up, push it in real hard. I'm gonna make, repeat that over and over again. Okay, I'm gonna use a nice tiny little circle here, circular motion, and just color in that white area. And I'm gonna mix this pinkish color up into that yellow green. And you're gonna notice what happens is it'll turn, that green will actually turn kind of a, that yellow green will actually turn kind of a peachy color, which I think is really pretty. So you can make your colors as dark or as light. If you want it to be light, then you just stop coloring. If you want it to be a little darker, then you just keep blending the color in until it gets to the brightness that you would like, the saturation. I tend to like things a little bit brighter. I like to blend a little bit of this pink down into the breast just to help draw that whole area together. And then I like to put a little bit of this bright pink over here. This is, I'm not a professionally trained artist, but I've done some reading. And this is a rule in quilting as well, not just, not just in, uh, you know, watercolor art or oil art or those kind of mediums. And that is, if you use one color, you should try to use that same color in maybe two or three different places so that it draws your eye around. So it doesn't actually change um, this color to this color, but it does brighten it up a little bit, and so it does move your eye around. Okay, so all the crayon colors are finished there. So now what I need to do is color the beak in. I'm gonna use a colored pencil. This is a dark sepia, which is kind of a gray-brown. You could use black, you could use dark, warm dark gray, which is another gray color. Um, but I'm gonna use this kind of brownish gray color to color in the beak. Now, ordinarily when I use pencil, I don't push real hard. But when I'm coloring the beak, I do, because I want to embed the pencil right into the fabric so that it won't move around or come off easily. So I'm pushing pretty hard. And then after I get that all colored, then I'll give it a quick press with the iron and that will set the color, melt it right into the fabric. Now these pencils are oil-based and like I said before, you can use any oil or wax-based pencil. Um, not watercolor pencils, don't use those. Um, oil or wax. Now this pencil is oil. Prismacolor pencils are wax. Either will work. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the shading and show you how to do that and again what my thought process is when I do that. Now what I'm going to get right now is a pencil sharpener because I want this pencil to be fairly sharp because I don't want to put a big thick line of color. I just want a nice skinny line of color. So here we go. These feathers are overlapping the body. So I'm gonna start right about here and start adding just a nice skinny little, thin, tiny little line of pencil right there. And the pencil is actually going on this part of the bird, just outside the edge of that line. So just I don't usually heat the fabric up when I put pencil on. However, um, if you do heat it up, just make it warm and then pencil will go on faster and smoother. Um, so I like to tell my students, if, if you heat it up, 
it will go on faster and smoother, but if you uh, make a mistake, that will go on faster <laughs> as well. So I usually work on cold fabric with pencil. Okay, so this is overlapping this. This feather is overlapping these feathers, so I'm going to start here and start adding that little line of shading. Now, the little line of shading, what it does is it, it says, t it tells your brain, your eye is telling your brain that this, these feathers are in front of these feathers. We're tr it's like tricking your brain, because we know that's not really true. But we're going to add that dimension so that when you look at this hummingbird, it'll look a little bit more real. Okay. So I've got all the shading there and there, and I'm going to take my stencil brush, and I'm just going to gently rub on that. And if you can see that real close, you can see how where I've used the stencil brush, it looks smoother and a little bit lighter. It just makes it look more realistic. Like shading should look. That's a, a real personal thing too. Um, how much shading you put in there and how dark the shading is, is a real personal thing. Some people like it very faint and light, other people like it really dark. Um, you also do not have to shade with brown or gray. And in fact, I've been told by um, artists who have taken my class that they learned that when you put shading in to use a darker color of what's already there. So you could use a dark purple or a really dark green um, or really dark uh, blue and then maybe just add a little gray to the touch and that's just a totally personal thing so that's something that you'll have to work out for yourself now the other thing that I do with pencil is when I cut the hummingbird out I don't really pay attention to am I leaving the black line on or am I cutting it off I don't pay attention either way I just cut it out if the black line gets left on, good. If it doesn't, that's okay, because what I'm gonna do when I get all done coloring is I'm gonna take my black or brown or gray pencil and I'm gonna put this line back on. And that's what you can do too. And I just put it back where I feel like it needs to go back. Okay, now here comes the peachy color the rosy color, and I, I love this. Take your yellow pencil and just gently add a layer of colored pencil right over the crayon, and I'm not pushing hard. If I want more color when I'm doing this or I'm doing my shading, if I want more color, I don't push harder. I just color longer. Because when you're doing your shading or you're working in an area where you're going to want to take a stencil brush and blend it, you want the pencil to sit right on top of the fabric. And then when you use the brush to blend it, it it'll move around. If you push really hard, you're going to embed that pencil right in the fabric. And then when you go to blend it, it doesn't want to move around very good. So when you're doing the shading or adding color like this, and you're going to want to blend it with the stencil brush. Just don't push hard, just gentle. And if you want to add more color, don't push harder, just color longer. Now, just as, just as a review, I did want to push hard when I colored the beak because I wanted it to be very dark. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blend that. I don't have to worry about blending that, so. All right, I think I have enough there. So I'm gonna take a nice clean, uh, not a nice clean one, but a stencil brush that already has yellow on it. Because this is a, something I want to tell you right now. This is a stencil brush that I used to blend the dark color on the wings and feathers. And so it has brown pencil on there. This is a stencil brush that I've used to blend yellow over the pink. If I use this one, it's going to get brown pencil all over this, and then it's not going to be as pretty going to kind of make it muddy colored. So get a clean stencil brush or clean this one and I'll show you how to clean your brush later but I'm going to use this stencil brush that has yellow and pink on it already and I'm just going to gently 
blend that yellow pencil all around, trying not to get the, on here. I don't want to get any of this brown into my yellow and green over here. So now you can see that has a really pretty kind of peachy rosy color. And then when you iron over it, it's going to set that color and it's even going to look a little different. And now that I've set that color, I think I'm going to go back while it's a little bit warm and add just a little bit more color to make it just a little bit brighter around the eye. I like that to be a little bit brighter. And again, that's just a totally personal thing. You can decide that for yourself. Okay, now one last thing before I am finished with this guy. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but this little pupil here, I've kind of colored in. So this hummingbird is starting to look kind of like maybe a zombie hummingbird. And zombies are really popular right now, but I want my hummingbird to look alive. So I'm gonna take a white pencil and I'm gonna put that little white dot back in. Now, if you've ever looked at hummingbirds up close, you know they don't really have an eye that looks like that. Hummingbirds have what I think look like shark eyes. They're just round and dark and there's really not much expression there but we forgive them because they're so cute. But I wanted my hummingbird to have a little bit different eye, so that's how I made it. And you can make yours any way you want too. So there, there you have it. The hummingbird is all colored. It's ready to go on your quilt. So what I usually do, let me show you the pattern that this hummingbird comes in. This is the pattern. I'll lay it right here. You can see that. Maybe I can hold it so it doesn't. There, you can see that pattern like that. Or I can hold it up here. And the hummingbird that I just colored is the hummingbird that's in this package. That might be better. Here, you can see it better. Right, so, oh, and I have the quote. And so on the back of my pattern, I give you life size, or you know, real size so you can use these um, as illustrations to look at when you're coloring so you say oh this is what this is supposed to look like here's the quilt so what I would do is I would color all of the pieces so that would be the hummingbird and let me get it this right side up there we go um, I would color the hummingbird and the flower and all of the greenery and then after I got it all colored, then I would cut this background fabric out, which is an ombre. And then I would lay all of my pieces right where I want them. Now, because you're using Steam Seam 2, when you pull this hummingbird off this pressing sheet, and because it's a non-stick pressing sheet, it's going to come right off. Now you have a sticky hummingbird, but it's colored. You would just put it right on your quilt background, just like this, and it's gonna stay there, because it's sticky. Then you add all your other pieces, and then you can rearrange them without too much problem because they're sticky, but they're not permanently fused down until you iron over everything with a hot iron. And when I do that, I take either a napkin or some kind of a piece of muslin either, even would work, uh, a ta um, kitchen towel would work, and you iron over it like so because just, just to protect it, just in case there was something on your iron, Murphy's Law says it's going to come off when you start ironing it down permanently on your quilt. So I, just to be safe, cover, cover it and then iron it. And then I turn it over and iron it from the other side. Now this is already quilted and it has a back on it. But what I would do is turn the background fabric over and then iron everything from the back side as well. And then that, that way you're sure that everything's stuck on good. Now I don't know if you can see this real close, but my quilter did a wonderful job of quilting. And they don't, my quilters, I usually have my quilts uh, professionally quilted. 
uh, they don't quilt right on the applique pieces to hold them on. If you use a good steam seam fusible web like I recommend, it, it should stay on. I mean, these are like art. These aren't on a bed. They don't get, you know, tossed around or folded or anything. I don't usually have a problem with anything coming off. Sometimes if little tiny skinny pieces like this might want to come up, and my quilts travel a lot too. So I'm not always, you know, sometimes they get folded and they get stuck in the mail and whatnot. So little pieces like this might start to come up. If they do, I just take a little bit of Aileen's, it's okay to wash it, glue, take a little paintbrush, put a little bit of that glue underneath there, stick it down, and I never have a problem with it coming up again. So you can quilt on top of your pieces if you want. You don't have to, to review, you don't have to, to hold them on. Um, some people just like to do that anyway, just to be sure. Okay, so there is that finished quilt. Here is the pattern. You can purchase this pattern online on my website. And there are a few quilt shops locally that will carry this too, but um, my website is uh, www.carriesquilts.com and I have this pattern on my website. I have this pansy pattern on my website. This poinsettia pattern on my website and this piece in the garden. These are all on my website. So you have your hummingbird finished. And I store these on a sheet like this or sometimes parchment paper. But you would completely color all of your pieces and then arrange them on the quilt, like so. And once you have them all in place, then you can iron them down. That is it. That is how you do the melt and blend technique. Not hard. Just step by step, add one color and then add the next color. But before I go, what I want to show you is how to clean these brushes because I have made the mistake in the past of trying to blend something that was pink or pretty purple or something like that and then blend, tried to blend with a brush that had brown pencil and it gets all muddy. And then it's like, it doesn't look as good. So you can either have lots of stencil brushes like I do, and you can have them, you know, one each color, a green, a brown, orange, red, or you can take your crayon cleaner and you can clean your brushes. And I just wanna show you how to do that really quick. Find my crayon cleaner, there it is. This is crayon cleaner. It's made by Beacon. You can order it online. Just uh, do a search for Beacon. It's just a liquid. Um, you can clean your brushes with uh, dish soap. It works just as well. I just like to use this because you don't have to rinse it off. So I'm gonna put a little bit right there, a few drops, and then you just take your stencil brush and squish it in there like so. And you can see that the pencil pigment is coming off in there. And then I just take a napkin and dry it off, squish it off, look at it, it's not quite clean, run it a little bit more, do that, look at it again, yep, that's clean. Now you can safely use that on any color. You want to wait till this dries before you use it. It dries pretty quickly. Sometimes, if I'm in a hurry, I'll maybe just run it on the hot iron like that. And there you go. If you have any questions, please call me. Um, I put my telephone number, my website, my email, uh, all of that is on all of my patterns. Please call me on the phone if you would like to um, or email me. Uh, that's not a problem either. If you start a project and you have a problem or you have a question that I have not answered here, then just get a hold of me and we'll talk on the phone and I'll try to help. Thank you very much for joining me uh, for this video and I hope to have some more and keep an eye out for them on my website and also on YouTube. Thanks.